Arturo Pittore here, but you can call me Art. This is Explorations in Art History, starring me. And the hand. Well, what about the rest of me? I'm waiting. Ow! Oh! Ow! Ow! What's happening to me? I feel so emotional, that all torn up, and like my life has been shattered, and I... Mm. Tissue, please? Okay, I see we're going to be talking about 20th century art. At the beginning of the 20th century, the fauves, a French term for wild beasts, led by Henri Matisse, used color in a way to defy reality. One term applied to the new approaches in art was avant-garde, a French military term that meant the advanced guard. Being avant-garde was the cool, hip, in thing to be. CHARGE! The son of a Spanish art professor, Pablo Picasso was an art prodigy, trained in the academic style, as shown by this self-portrait he painted at 14. In 1907, Picasso began painting Les Damoiselles d'Avignon. This groundbreaking painting replaced the linear perspective and rounded volumes of traditional art with splintered planes and a deliberately flat 2D surface. It kicked off a new experimental movement called Cubism. Mr. Art, your mission, if you decide to accept it, is to infiltrate the Dada movement. The time? 1916. During World War I, a group of rebel artists decided if society was going to behave so badly, then they wanted no part of its traditions. Marcel Duchamp started by painting a mustache and beard on the Mona Lisa, and a French vulgarity underneath. Rude. The only rule of the Dadas was no rules. So Duchamp then exhibited a urinal as a piece of modern sculpture, named it The Fountain, and signed it with a fake name, Arturo Pittore. After all, without rules, anything could be art. At first, the public was revolted, which delighted the Dadaists. Their art was meant to be a poke in the eye of the world, and it was succeeding. But eventually, Dadaism became accepted and even respected, shocking the Dadaists and causing their movement to self-destruct in five, four, three, two, one. For surrealists, there was another landscape to explore, the landscape of dreams. Salvador Dali, flamboyant, eccentric, and a master of self-promotion, painted The Persistence of Memory in 1931. Some critics interpreted this work as a visual expression of the new theory of relativity. But when asked on his deathbed if the imagery of the melting pocket watches had to do with Einstein's theories, Dali replied, No, it's based on my perception of camembert cheese melting in the sun. Huh. The Belgian artist René Magritte created his surrealistic fantasies by combining everyday objects together in unusual combinations and applying a twist to the logic of the world. Some critics complained that his art provided no answers, only enigmas. And don't ask me, you can't expect a man with an apple on his nose to provide any answers. As a child, Vasily Kandinsky learned to play cello and piano. As a leader in the art movement called German Expressionism, Kandinsky was deeply influenced by music his whole life. Kandinsky claimed he could see musical tones as colors and vice versa. He left behind representational art for pure abstract compositions, painting colors as notes to create visual harmonies that, like music, expressed various emotional states. Though born in Russia, he spent much of his adult life in Germany until the Nazis came to power in 1933 and he fled to Paris. Abstract Expressionism emerged in America out of the chaos of World War II. More a philosophy than a distinct style, its leading figure, Jackson Pollock, developed a new technique of dripping paint onto a large canvas. Pollock would dance around the canvas, flinging paint like a jazz musician, improvising as his mood dictated. Abstract Expressionism was the first American art movement to gain international significance. Just make sure you're not in the line of fire when the creativity is flowing. Anybody got a uh, moist towelette, please? Tissue? Napkin? Pow! Biff! Bam! Pop art was a sock in the solar plexus to the intellectualism of abstract expressionism. 
Andy Warhol, who trained as a commercial artist, was able to bridge the prejudice gap of the fine art world with his large prints of images from popular culture. Mixing low art with high art, potato, potato, tomato, tomato, soup's on. In the 60s, rock and roll music made the teenagers dance and op art aimed to make eyeballs rock and roll with their optical illusions. Like this composition by Bridget Riley called Movement in Squares. When you stare at it, the eyes see an illusion of movement. It's, whoa, I'm feeling kind of queasy. Is the painting moving or if we put out to sea? A little Dramamine on the set, please. Oh, I need to sit down. Georgia O'Keeffe lived in New York City, but loved New Mexico, which she called the far way. When her husband, the famous photographer Alfred Stieglitz, passed away, she moved to her land of inspiration. Explaining her large paintings of flowers portrayed as if under a magnifying glass, she said, well, I made you take time to look at what I saw. Something new from something old. Born a Pueblo Indian in Santa Fe, Maria Martinez was inspired by ancient pottery shards of the Neolithic ancestors of her tribe. Trying to recreate the black-on-black -black designs took a long process of trial and error. She eventually mastered the process, bringing the past into the present and helping to create a new recognition of pottery as art for the modern world. Built in the Great Salt Lake, Smithson's Spiral Jetty is a sample of another kind of art which is called earthwork sculpture, or land art. Unlike outdoor sculptures created in a studio and then added to the landscape, land art is made from nature, soil, rocks, logs, branches, and water, and is made to exist as part of the landscape. 20th century art, often just called modern art, was above all else experimental. As the century progressed, art became less group movement oriented and more of an individual search for new creative ways of expression. Ah.